Before we go, we dive in, kind of kind of some audience participation. I don't know if anybody here in the room, you're like me. Anybody here growing up, you were a fan of superheroes. Any superhero fans? Come on, like Avengers, Batman, Superman, Aquaman, Flash. And uh, for me, my personal favorite was Spider-Man. Uh, you know, there was something about Spider-Man. Peter Parker in and of himself, totally unimpressive. But in a spider suit, amazing. Come on. Maybe that's a secret. Um, but he, he had this, you know, supernatural power come on him where he could like, even though he was like a small man, he could beat up bad guys. He could scale tall buildings. He could somehow shoot webs out of his wrists. I don't know how that happens. And uh, he could have this superhero, supernatural strength. And I think there's something about superheroes that attracts all of us because there's something about when we see someone who's very natural, very normal, but then this supernatural power comes on them. And may I submit to you that I believe firmly that that kind of attraction in our hearts is from God. Because we are called to live a life where we experience the supernatural power of God. That we are not called to go through life fully in our natural strength without the help of the Holy Spirit. That we are called to experience God's supernatural power. We're called to experience miracles. I'd like to give some context, kind of an operating definition, a working definition of miracles uh, is this, that a miracle is an act of God beyond human understanding that displays God's power, inspires wonder, and acts as a sign that God is at work in the world. Uh, We see miracles all throughout the scriptures. In fact, in the Old Testament, We see, conservatively speaking, um, over 80 documented miracles and and much more than that because it was believed when you read the Old Testament that even things of natural order were a miracle. And they are because here's why. Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God. God spoke, the world came into being. How many of you know even nature in and of itself speaks of God's wonder-working power? Can I get an amen? The fact that the sun rose again today, the fact that flowers bloom, the fact that there's vegetation for us to eat in and of itself is proof that God is a wonder-working, miracle-working God. The fact that you woke up this morning is a miracle (laughs) that we see all throughout the Scriptures. In the Old Testament or New Testament, there are also over, over 80 conservatively speaking, some at the hands of the apostles and disciples, of course. It's God who does the miracles. We're merely vessels he works through. And in the Gospels, there are 37 documented miracles that Jesus himself performed. But we know from John that wasn't the only miracles he performed because in the book of John, it says that actually that what we read in the Gospels is just a snippet of the life of Jesus. That in fact, if they recorded all of the works that Jesus did, there would not be bo- there are not books enough in the world to contain them. This is how incredible our God is. That He is a miracle working God. And Jesus told His disciples that all authority I have, I now give to you. That the same power that rose Christ Jesus from the grave, it lives on the inside of you. You are not called to live a Christian life apart from the power of the Holy Spirit. And I want to talk today in this series, next few weeks, about how do we experience this supernatural power of God in our life. And let me speak to the purposes of miracles. Because miracles do serve a purpose we see in the scriptures is that miracles actually awaken us to the presence of God in our lives. And may I say this, the true gift of life is not the miracles God does for us, but it is actually his presence with us. That's the miracle. That's the gift. What did God tell Abraham? I am your great reward. Yes, God does miracles, but the beauty of life, the gift of life, is not even the miracles but it's, what God, it's God's presence with us. Now, I love this quote by Blaise Pascal. He's a physicist and mathematician. 
You know, and he says this, it is impossible on reasonable grounds to disbelieve miracles. Here's a man who studied physical science. He said the evidence is clear beyond that a shadow of a doubt that God is at work in the world. Now I want to talk today about how do we experience God's miracle working power. In fact, today is sort of an introductory message into the series called Supernatural. And we're going to be kind of the title of today's message is God of Miracles. Because I really want to lay the case, looking at the scriptures, that we serve a God who does miracles. And in this series, we're going to look primarily at the life of Jesus. Because there's 37 documented miracles that Jesus performed. And we're going to look at those miracles and glean some principles about how we can experience his power. But before we do that, let's pray. Father, we thank you that your word is truly a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And we pray, God, that as we open your word, Father, we didn't just come to hear a helpful message. We came to hear from heaven. And, Father, we believe that your word is living and active. It's not just a normal book, God, that you you desire to speak. You are speaking. So, Father, we say speak. Your servants are listening, God. And we just right now open our hearts. We open our minds to hear what you have for us right now. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Luke 8, if you have your Bibles, let me give you a little bit of context of Luke 8. Jesus had just gotten finished teaching his disciples. Um, Then he actually delivered um, a man from the oppression of demons. And then in Luke 8, we're going to pick up verse 41. He kind of continues on with his miracle working power. It says this in verse 41. A man named Jairus, a synagogue leader, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house Because his only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. But no one could heal her. She came up behind him, touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, someone touched me. I know that power has gone out from me. And the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. And I want to talk today, in fact, sort of a sermon in a sentence is that God does miracles in response to our faith. Now, God can do miracles apart from our faith. Sometimes he just does miracles because he's good. But we see scripturally, especially in the New Testament, especially in the Gospels, God responds to the faith of his people. In fact, the foundation of a life of miracles is faith in God. And it's actually God who does the work. It's not us. It's not the work of a man or a woman. It is the work of God on the earth. I want to share with you three truths I want you to embrace about God's miracle working power in order for us to experience it in our life. Here's the first point if you're taking notes. The first truth I want you to take hold of is that God makes the impossible possible. That he is a God, the scripture says, nothing is impossible for God. That he is a miracle-working God. <laughs> that, that when we face situations, which if you are, have breath in your lungs, there will come moments and times where you will face impossible situations. And, and may I just say this to you, that actually God does his greatest work in the impossible situations of life. Now, I was reminded this week, my daughter Abigail, she's four years old. She went into our pantry at our house. She was reaching up for a, a Z-bar which is like a kid's protein bar. And she's reaching up for it. And I could, I could tell she was trying hard. I even heard a little grunting in the, in the pantry. She's like, ah, ah. And about two minutes after, she came out and she said, Daddy, can you help me? I said, no, you figured it out on your own. I'm just kidding. Some of you thought I was serious. You're like, oh, my gosh. I said, of course I'll help you, right? And here's about Abby I've noticed. When Abby recognizes her limitations as a four-foot, four-year-old, she recognizes where I have limitations, dad does not. 
And can I tell you, you have limitations, but you serve a God who knows their limitations. You have weakness, but our God's strength is perfected in your weakness. You don't know some things, but we serve a God who is all-knowing. That we have access to the power that God has for us. And may I say this, there are some sicknesses that we will face that physicians cannot heal, but the great physician can heal. There are some emotional ailments that the best clinicians in the world and psychiatrists in the world cannot soothe, but our God can soothe. There are some problems on your best day that you cannot solve, but our God can. He is a miracle-working God, and he does his best best work when we face impossible situations. He does his best work when we come up against our limitations. I want to get it into your spirit that we serve a God who does the impossible in our life. We serve a God who does the supernatural in our life. The psalmist said in Psalm 77, 14, you are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among your peoples. And can I tell you why God does miracles? This is important. God wants to do miracles in your life because he loves you. What do we just sing? God heals because he loves. That miracles are the are the consequence of his love for us, that he wants to heal, that he wants to move on our behalf. He wants to supernaturally provide for us. I love what Jeremiah said in Jeremiah 32, 17. He said, Sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. I can imagine Jeremiah reflecting upon how Genesis 1-1, God spoke the world into existence. Or in Exodus, how God led the people of Israel out of slavery and into freedom and part of the Red Sea. I can imagine Jeremiah reflecting upon the faithfulness of God, that even when the people of God were faithless, God was faithful. And here's what he's saying, God, nothing is too hard for you. This week, one of the things that occupied my time personally, we moved into our current house that we live in. Uh, we knew, they kind of told us, hey, the HVAC system is, is old. In fact, it's 30 years old. And we kind of knew we moved in like, hey, you're probably going to have to replace this. And sure enough, our HVAC has breathed its last breath. So I went to have to go find a HVAC company and get some quotes for a new system. So what I did, probably like you do when you are looking for a company or you're maybe researching a restaurant or a movie you want to watch, you go online and I read Google reviews and Yelp reviews, right? You know, back in, I remember years ago before there were all these reviews and you would ask people for recommendations. Do you have recommendations of who to work, you know, who to work with or a restaurant? And now we can like now see, right, before you go to a restaurant, you can see is the food good? Is the service good? And the, and the phrase for that, the term for that is called social proof. That we look for social proof that actually what they are promising they deliver. In fact, some of you have told me this. When you've come to Catalyst, you read our reviews on Google and Yelp. You were looking for social proof. On a side note, leave us a review on Google and Yelp. <laughs> if it's five stars, okay? That's the only reviews we accept. No, but, but we look for social proof. We look for, like, is this legit? And can I tell you, because we have the holy, canonized, infallible, authoritative word of God, we have social proof that God is a miracle-working God. We have social proof that God part of the Jordan River. We have social proof that God brought down the walls of Jericho. We have social proof that God healed Naaman of leprosy. We have social proof that God opened the eyes of blind Bartimaeus. We have social proof that God raised Lazarus, a dead man back to life. We have social proof that God took a few fish, a few loaves, and fed 5,000 men and women and children. We have social proof that God is a miracle-working God all throughout the Scriptures. I commend you for sitting under the teaching of the Word of God. But listen, become a student of the Word of God every day. I can tell you countless days that my faith is encouraged in my daily Bible reading plan because I read about God's faithfulness then, and I say, God, you were faithful then. I believe you can do it again. It's the power of the Word, church. 
that we have social proof in the word of God. I love what Paul said to the Thessalonian church in 1 Thessalonians 5.11. He says, encourage each other and build each other up just as you are already doing. And Hebrews says this, to not neglect the gathering together, to, to, to encourage each other. That there's something to the gathering and encouraging one another. That one of the ways you can boost your faith is to spend time with the people of God. Because there's something powerful when you get around the people of God and you hear stories of God's faithfulness. May I speak to those of you in the room, you've been following God for 5 years, 10 years, 20 years, some of you 30 years. Can I tell you this? We need your testimonies of God's goodness in your life. Because you have stories of someone who's been healed. You have stories and when you didn't have and God provided. You have stories how God strengthened your marriage. You have stories of God's supernatural power. And we need to hear them. Here's why. The book of Revelation says this. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb, that's Jesus, and the word of our testimony. You need to share the stories of God. You need to share how when you didn't have and God provided. You need to share how when you were in need of healing and God healed. You need to share how God reconciled that relationship. You need to share how God opened that door at work. You need to share stories of God's goodness. Two months ago, I was in New York. I had a friend of mine. He had a a building dedication. And it was encouraging my faith. He's in New York and, you know, it's it's a city where... Not many churches get permanent buildings. And he, they turned an old CVS into a church. Come on, the place was once full of drugs, now full of the Holy Ghost. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Both will get you high, but one is far better. Come on. <laughs> and, and, it, and it was inspiring. Because here you are in New York, and, and, and lives are being changed in this building. And then I ran into a friend of mine from, from Houston. He planted his church about six months after we started Catalyst. And we were just catching up. And then he shared to me how like the week prior, like a month prior, a church in Houston, out of the blue, called him. And the pastor was retiring and said, we want to give you our building. Then I said, would you lay hands on me and pray for me? Come on, <laughs> sentence right there. If you don't know, we're in the process. We stepped out in faith last year with our Believe initiative, believing God for a more permanent home. And, and those stories encouraged my faith. I said, God, if you can do it for them, you can do it for us. And that's the power of getting on the people of God because you hear stories like that. And can I tell you, the enemy would love for you to live isolated. And let me say this. You can actually come to church on Sunday and still be isolated in community. It's far more than Sunday. That's why I tell, I tell you all the time, listen, come to church early and stay late. Linger in the lobby. Here's why. Because, listen, we need each other. The Bible's clear. Get into a community group on June 11th. Sign up for one. Get planted. Join a serving team. Get around the people of God so when your marriage is struggling, you can hear a story of somebody else's marriage that has been strengthened by the Holy Spirit. It can encourage you. That means when you're sick and you hear somebody else's story of healing from cancer, like Pastor Anu. Come on, anybody else, your faith was encouraged by Pastor Anu? Like, that's real. God healed him. And listen, God can do it for you. Like, we need to hear each other's stories. We have the the canonized scriptures full of God's faithfulness, but there's something also powerful when I hear God's faithfulness to you. We need it, church. We need each other. God, our God is a God who makes the impossible possible. This is who he is. Here's point two. Point two is this, is that God responds to faith, not need. He responds to faith, not need. I love this moment because here's a, this woman is in a crowded street. And, um, you know, they were sort of, Jesus asked Peter, who touched me? I don't know about you, but I love Peter. I love Peter because he's a little bit emotional. I'm a little bit emotional, if you haven't, can't tell. 
And um, I, mean, I kind of felt Peter when he cut that man's ear off towards the end of the Gospels. Because I'm kind of like, you know what, I understand. You cross my family, I'm going to cut your ear off probably, okay. <laughs> you cross my kids, I will definitely cut you, okay. <laughs> Christina says I shouldn't say that, but I'm just being real with who I am. I need Jesus, okay. <laughs> just don't cross my kids. Um, but Peter in this moment's like, Jesus, what do you mean who touched you? You're in a crowded street. It's like, what do you mean? It's like, you, ever, you ever been downtown the National Mall, 4th of July? If you were to ask somebody who touched you, it's like, I don't know, 20 people are touching me right now. And this bro is sweating on me. I went one time to down the National Mall, 4th of July. I will never go again. I said, the Lord is not in this place because it is very uncomfortable. I got sweat on me and it's not my own. I'm done. Come on. <laughs> People have invited me to different things. Hey, we're come downtown. No, I'm not. No, no. I watch it on TV. But he's like, what do you mean who touched you? People are all around you. This is important. It, what this tells us is this, is that only one woman out of this whole crowd received God's healing power. You can be in the presence of God and actually miss out on the power of God. Let me tell you how this happens. Let's look at the scriptures. Mark 6. Mark 6, Jesus is in his hometown of Nazareth. And it says this in Mark 6, verse 5, that he could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. Watch this. If you, if you got your paper Bible with you, underline it, highlight it on your version Bible app, post it on Twitter. He was amazed at their lack of faith. And God, may it never be said about me that you're amazed by my lack of faith. Like he was amazed by how much they disbelieved in him. Same Jesus. Same power. Here's why. If you read the whole text in Mark 6, the people in Nazareth are like this. Oh, look, it's Jesus. Yeah, a carpenter. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's Jesus. Oh, it's Jesus. And Mary's son. Remember Mary's son? I remember you on pull-ups, Jesus. Oh, that's Jesus. That's James' brother. You know, James, we don't like that much. You know, That's his brother. Watch this. Here's what happened. Their familiarity with God caused them to miss out on a move of God. Can I speak to you who have been following Jesus for some time? Right now. If that's you, I want you to lean in. Because you are susceptible to this. Is that our familiarity with God can cause us to miss out on a miracle from God. Here's how it plays out. Is we, we can hear a sermon like this one. And we hear Luke chapter 8. And you've already heard four sermons about Luke chapter 8 before. And you've read it 12 times. See, when you hear me read the text, you already start thinking in your mind, oh, well, I know what he's going to say. Oh, I, I know what's going to happen. And you kind of go into this sort of almost, you know, you know what's going to happen. Or you've been to church so many times, you're well churched. This is a danger for well-churched people. There's a lot of you in the room that you can come into church and think, well, I know it's going to happen. It's going to be three songs. Pastor Jeremy will have three points. And I do have three points. <laughs> and here's what can happen. Is that your familiarity with God can cause you to dishonor God. Because you're actually saying this. You're saying, listen, I know what's going to happen already, God. And the Bible says he is doing a new thing. That he is doing something fresh in your life. What's the solution to familiarity? Because we're all going to face it. Like, hopefully, you're living a life where you're close enough to God that you're becoming familiar with God. So what's the solution to spiritual familiarity? It's holy curiosity. It's you remain curious. I read a book years ago on marriage and sexuality by a neuropsychologist. And he was describing from a neurochemical perspective one of the reasons why affairs can happen, and he said because neurochemically we are conditioned to like new things. That's why the grand opening of a business or a restaurant will have more patrons or clients than a normal day. That's why the opening day of the baseball season, the parks are packed. After that, they're not. That's why the, the first show of a new series on Netflix gets the most views. But then people slowly trickle off because we like new things. Like I like new, I like fresh. 
And here's what this guy said in the context of marriage. He said that's why a lot of times people end up drifting in their marriage. And they think that in order to satisfy their desire for new, they have to find a new person. But he said your spouse is, this is a little side note for, for married couples, for all couples. Your spouse is changing every day. So have a curiosity about your spouse. Like seek to learn them every day, to learn their heart, to learn because they're changing every day. So he says that your marriage can grow stale if you lack curiosity about your spouse. May I say this? Your relationship with God can grow stale if you lose your curiosity about him. And may I say this lovingly but very directly to you. If your relationship with God is stale, it's not him, it's you. A hundred percent of the time. Because he is a speaking God. Can I get an amen? amen? He is a moving God. He is a God who wants to do a new work in your life. So if you feel like a church service was stale, it ain't him. It's you. If you feel like your time in the Bible was stale, it ain't him. It's you. If you feel like your prayer moment was stale, it ain't him. It's you. And I'm not saying this to condemn you. I'm saying this to inspire you. So what do you do? Develop a holy curiosity. You know, I think practically, God spoke to me personally this week about it. It's go back to how you were the first time you realized how much God loved you. Go back to the time when you first fell in love with him, when you realized, oh, God, your words are life. Oh, God, your presence is amazing. The time in your life when you had to pull yourself away from your devotional time in order to get to work on time or school on time. That moment where every time the doors of the church were open, you were in. Whereas maybe right now, you struggle getting in late. Listen, sometimes we can lose our honor for the presence of God because we are too familiar with God. And I think in our Western culture, we have so much worship music and the Bible so easily accessible, we can become too familiar. And let me say this, write this down. Faith leaks. Faith leaks. How the enemy will end up leading you to live a faithless life. He won't show up tomorrow morning and, be, and do something outrageous to cause you to be faithless. Here's how it starts. You begin to lose your spiritual fervor. What did Jesus say? Zeal for your house will consume me. Listen, we are all called to have a passion for God. Passion's not loud. That's just my dysfunction, okay? (laughs) But you are called to be passionate. You are called to have a zeal. You are called to have a fervor. Here's what happens. You lose your fervor. And here's how you know you lost your fervor. Is you no longer have the same excitement about reading the word. No longer excitement for the presence of God. Excitement for prayer. So you gotta, you got to stir that fervor back up again. Here's a side note. Here's a way you can stir your fervor. Get around other people who have it. It's contagious. And then what happens is you lose your fervor, and then you become less faithful. You're like, oh, you know what, I don't, I'm kind of tired. I kind of had a long weekend. I'm just not going to go to church today. Or you get up and, and, and you kind of just say, you know what, I'm just going to, I'm just going to get into work early today. I'm not going to read my Bible or pray. And please hear this. It's not about a religious activity. Because passion is a posture of your heart. It's, It's you've lost that light. God, you're first. God, I need you. May I say this? The moment you have forgotten how dependent you are, you are on God, you're losing your fervor. And it's dependency on God that causes you to prioritize his word, that causes you to prioritize church, that causes you to prioritize his presence. And when you forget to lose sight of how dependent you really are on God, that's what happens. So you lose your fervor, you lose your faithfulness, and then you become faithless. And you stop believing God. And that's how it happens. It's a slow leak in our life. So can I encourage you if that's you? And here's what I'm going to presume. There's probably many of you in this room like that, just knowing statistically speaking. And I've been there. I've lost my fervor in the past. It's stirred up once again. Say, oh, here's what what Jesus said. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be filled. Say, God, stir a hunger in me again. God, stir a thirst in me again for your presence. God, remind me again. Of that love that I had when I first came to you. Stir that back in me again. Now, I love this woman because you can tell by the nature of what happens. She's in a crowded street. 
many people pressing around Jesus. But she still was able to touch him. That tells me she, was, she, was, she had some persistence in her. I imagine maybe she was kind of moving a few bows around. Come on. She was like, well, I got to get to Jesus. Come on, somebody. And she touched him. She had to press through the crowd. She had a persistence. And can I tell you what we see in the New Testament is a value that the Scripture holds is being a persistent person. You're going to see a number of words throughout the New Testament writers. You're going to hear about being a steadfastness. Paul says stand firm in your faith. James says persevere. Do you know this? You only have to persevere when it's hard. (laughs) You only have to persist when it's not easy. That means you will have some days you will get up and you don't feel like praising God. And you persist anyway. You don't feel like praying. You persevere anyway. You don't feel like believing, but you stand firm in your faith. You have to persist. You have to persevere. I love what Paul said in Ephesians 6.18. He says, stay alert and be persistent in your prayers. He says this in the context of spiritual warfare. This past week in the Burroughs household, we uh, watched the new Super Mario Brothers movie. I don't know if you've seen it. Um, but there's, there's a scene in the movie. And Mario fights against Donkey Kong. It's epic. And Donkey Kong is like most of the time beating him, about to defeat him. Then Mario comes back. He takes his superpower, turns into a cat. You've got to see it. And he defeats Donkey Kong. And then afterwards, and here's the scene I want to talk about. So afterwards, Mario's with Princess Peach, the girl he's trying to win over. And she's like, she's like, Mario. She's like, you just got beat, and then you got back up. You got your beat, and then you got back up. He kept beating you, but you kept getting back up. And she said, she said, you, you, you never quit. And he was like, I don't think it was that big of a deal. She said, she said, that's a great saying. Can I tell you what a life of faith often looks like? You get discouraged, you get back up. You don't feel like it, you keep going. You keep going. And here's, here's what it tells us. Listen, if we have to persist, if we have to persevere, if we have to be steadfast, if we have to stand firm in our faith, it means that sometimes some miracles, I know, I, know I, hate, I hate what I'm about to say, but it's true. Some miracles are going to take longer than you want them to. Why? I have no clue. But I am reminded of the scripture in Daniel 10 where Daniel is, is, is praying to God for 21 days. That's where we get 21 days of prayer and fasting. 21 days he's praying, and the angel finally comes on the 21st day and blesses him. And the, and the angel says this, um, I wanted to come on the first day, but the prince of Persia was resisting me. That there was spiritual warfare. So what that means, if you are still believing God to heal your sickness, that you keep praying. If you're still expecting a breakthrough at work, you keep believing. If you are still in need of a miracle in your life, you keep remaining faithful. What did Paul say in Romans 12, 12? Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. I just woke somebody up. Keep (laughs) on praying. I haven't seen the miracle. It's been seven years. Keep on praying. My marriage hasn't gotten better the last four years. Keep on praying. I've been overlooked again for another promotion. Keep on praying. My aunt is still battling cancer. Keep on praying. This situation at work isn't getting any better. Keep on praying. My child is still having struggles at school. Keep on praying. Praying. I still wake up in the middle of the night with anxiety. It's crippling. Keep on praying. I've been going to counseling, but I'm still struggling with an addiction. Keep on praying. Be persistent. Faith is persistent, church. So God, God makes the impossible possible. And this is so important, write this down. Just because you have a need, God will not move. 
He responds to faith. He is moved by faith and not by need. Here's the last point. Is that God wants to do a miracle for us and in us. This woman has an issue of blood, a hemorrhaging of some sort. We don't know the details, but here's what we do know. That if you were bleeding anywhere in your body, you had any kind of hemorrhaging in your body, you were deemed by the law to be ceremonially unclean. That means you could not come into worship at the temple because you were unclean. It means you couldn't go into social gatherings. So imagine this, for 12 years, not only did she have nonstop bleeding, but she was unable to go into the temple to worship. Come on, she couldn't go to her nephew's birthday party. She couldn't go to that Super Bowl party if they had one. She couldn't go into public. It was illegal. It was against the law for her to go out in public. Imagine this, for 12 years and never receive a hug. 12 years. No one to put their hand on your shoulder and pray for you for 12 years. I presume if that was the case for 12 years, not only was she in physical pain, but probably emotional pain. But she not only needed the healing in her body, she needed healing in her soul. And this woman in this moment that she, she risked further social ostracization. She risked potential financial loss. And she risked potential physical loss of her life. Because what she was doing, for her to have an issue of blood and to be in a crowded street was against the law. Because she couldn't touch anybody. So this woman was doing something illegal in order to get a miracle from God. Now don't take that as liberty to go break the law tonight, okay? (laughs) Unless you have to, okay? And don't say what my pastor told me. (laughs) Um... But, but she, was, she, was, she, she was willing to pay the cost. And this is important. I think sometimes if we're not careful, <clears throat> you know, that we can approach God expecting him to do everything. But we do play a part. And let me just say this. There are a lot of times that miracles have a cost. There is a risk that you are called to take. Maybe you're thinking, well, Jeremy, that's just for you as a pastor or certain Christians. No, Matthew 16, 14, Jesus said, if you want to be my follower, take up your cross, deny yourself. That's a cost. (laughs) Lay yourself down. What did Jesus pray in the garden? Father, not my will, but your will be done. What did Jesus say in John? If you want to truly save your life, lose your life. Paul said in Galatians 2.20, in fact, Paul also said this, to live is Christ, to die is gain. Galatians 2.20, he says, I've been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Do you want to know what, what oftentimes is the prerequisite for a miracle? Is death to self. Meaning this is death to your pride, death to your will. As you say, God, not my will be done, your will be done. Not what I want, but what you want, God. <clears throat> In fact, if you read the Bible, there's actually some blessings, some supernatural blessings and miracles tied to our obedience. One, for example, all throughout Old and New Testament, there is, like Old Testament talks about when you bring the tithe, about generosity. You want a financial blessing? He says, bring the tithe and see that I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven upon you. What did Jesus say in the Gospels? Jesus said, give and it will be given unto you. Pressed down, shaken together. So I'm going to say this lovingly but directly. Sometimes we're praying God for a miracle. And I think he's in heaven just saying, do what I've already told you to do. Like you don't need to pray, you need to obey. Someone write that down. Okay, I didn't get that first service. Like, you don't need to pray. You just got to do what he already said to do. Like, there are some supernatural miracles and blessings God has for you. What did Jesus say? He says, those who hear my words and then leave church and do nothing about it will be blessed. 
no. And I say this, sometimes you don't need a fresh word from God. You need to do what you already know to do. It's just going to cost. That's all we don't do it. Can I be honest? The areas I don't disobey, because it costs too much sometimes. I'm like, ooh, okay, God. Did, did, maybe you didn't mean that, Lord. Right? Anybody else? Well, maybe this text didn't really mean that. No, all throughout the scripture. He says you are blessed if you hear my words and put them into practice. Not just when you feel like it, not just when you want to, but all the time. I was reminded of uh, last year. There was a moment where God had asked me to do something that I didn't want to do. And uh, so last fall, many of you know this, we, we, we launched our Believe initiative. Uh, we were believing God for the next two years to raise three and a half million dollars of all in giving to every dollar that comes in to forward the vision of our church to include positioning ourselves for a more permanent home. So we were already in, in process of that. And it was last fall. And God began to speak to me about, um, there was a church in the area that we, um, we, we gave to when they launched. Um, if, you're, if you're new to Catalyst, we, we sow into church planting because we believe in the power of the local church. So we gave to this church um, to who were, who were starting. And, and they had already been gone for like a year. And, and, and I, I kept feeling this like reoccurring thought of like, we're to give this church again. I'm going to be honest. I was like, God, you know we're trying to raise money for a building. Not now, right? Anybody else, you ever try to, try to tell God, like, God, haven't I done enough? <laughs> That's what I was like. I'm like, God, you see what we're doing here on earth, okay? But it wouldn't leave me. So finally, I wish I could say, I know all of you, when you hear from God, you immediately obey. But I sometimes drag my feet. I drag my feet. So eventually one Friday morning, I remember this so clear. I was out of town. And it was a Friday morning I got up and it just wouldn't leave me. And I was like, okay, I, I'm going to obey God. I trust you. So I gave this gift to this church. In fact, the pastor called me like, he's a friend of mine, maybe four hours later. And he said, he said, hey, I just got a notification. You guys, you know, sewed into our church. Thank you so much. Like, he's like, you know, what, what caused that? I said, to be honest with you, I just had this. I thought it was the Lord just kept telling me to give to your church. And we love you and we're for you. So that was that. So about a month later, the same guy calls me. And he says, um, he says, hey, do you have a moment? I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, hey, what's the best way to give to Catalyst? And uh, he went on to explain that actually the month prior to us giving our gift, the Lord spoke to him about giving a gift to our Believe Initiative. This is another church. I, I don't, I'm not making this up. It's too good to, to make up. The gift they gave to Catalyst was ten times what we gave to the church. Ten times. As amazing of a miracle as it was for us as a church, can I tell you what it did in me? God did not just do a miracle for us. He did a miracle in my heart. And here's what it was. God worked in me that, that Jeremy, I am Jehovah Jireh. I am your provider. You are not your provider. The church isn't its provider. I am your provider. And that's the kind of miracle that God wants to do. When you trust him and say, God, I don't know how this is going to work if I give this gift. God, I don't know how this is going to work if I obey this word. God, I don't know how this is going to work. And then when you trust him and then when you see him move and then when you deepen your trust and faith in him, he said, that's the miracle I want to do. And he calls this woman, tells her to stand up. She gets up. And he tells her before all the people, your faith has made you well. Now, why was this powerful? Because in this crowd would have been people who for years knew she was an unclean person. Meaning you couldn't touch her. She couldn't be in the temple. She couldn't come over to our house. And Jesus in this moment, because what he did, he didn't just bring healing to our body. He brought healing to her soul. He said, daughter, your faith has made you well. You are no longer unclean. 
you are now fully reconciled back into your community. Because God is wants to do not just a miracle for you. He does not just want to do the healing. He doesn't just want to, want to give you provision. He doesn't just want to do the miracle for you. He wants to do a great work in you. Remember, because the power of miracles is this. And I close with this. The gift of a miracle is not even what he does for you. It's a greater awareness of him. Because God is our great reward, church. Bow your heads with me.